Good afternoon. Anti-Semitism is often called the world's oldest hatred. It has been a fact of life for so many generations of Jews. But after the Holocaust, the establishment of the State of Israel, and Jews flourishing in places like the United States, it seemed that anti-Semitism had truly been pushed to the fringes. For decades, it felt like we had won. But now, it seems that every week, sometimes every day, there is news of another act of vandalism, a Jewish person harassed or beaten, another institution turning a blind eye to Jew hatred, and the far right, the extreme left, religious radicals and others continue to demonstrate the many forms of anti-Semitism that are permeating society. And Jews are worried. AJC's own research bears this out. Last year, nearly one third of Jewish survey respondents told AJC they either refrained from wearing items that would identify them as Jewish, avoided attending Jewish events or places, or hesitated when posting content online that might reveal their views on Jewish issues. What a profoundly sad and frightening trend. But as is so often the case in Jewish history, there are those who are standing up, speaking out, and fighting back. Today we'll hear from, from inspiring Jewish leaders from across the country who refuse to stay silent. To kick us off, I am especially delighted to introduce Natalie Kahn, a student at Harvard University. Last month, Natalie did something extraordinarily brave at Harvard. She stood up for Israel and against anti-Semitism. I know you'll be inspired by her story. We will then be joined by Jacob Kornblow, senior political reporter for The Forward, April Powers, managing director for DEI Strategy for First Impression Rx, and Andrew Rayfeld, president of Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, who will discuss their firsthand experiences with anti-Semitism in the United States. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Natalie Kahn. Sorry, a little short. On April 29th, the Harvard Crimson's editorial board capped off the semester with a staff editorial endorsing the boycott, divestment, and sanctions BDS movement. Even as president of Harvard's Hillel, my initial response was to try and downplay the magnitude of this endorsement. After all, as an associate news editor for the Crimson, I know the editorial board is only a small group of students on campus, and one that's not necessarily representative of the student body as a whole. I felt the best solution was to not make too big a deal of it. But in the hours and days that followed, I received dozens of messages about how everyone was up in arms, everyone was so upset, how alumni were mobilizing to write a letter. What can we do to stop them? How can Harvard allow this to happen? Harvard University should condemn the crimson, were all messages that I received. As a news editor, I can almost never write editorials, but the many messages and the perception that everyone affiliated with the crimson, myself included, was endorsing BDS, led me to seek special permission to respond with my own editorial which I titled, I am a Crimson Editor and I Stand with Israel. After my response was published, I received countless media inquiries. The Forward, The Times of Israel, Jerusalem Post, Fox News, Washington Post, and Al Jazeera would all go on to reference the Crimson's editorial board's endorsement, whether through news coverage of their own or their own editorials. And many of these outlets reached out to me about my response. Even Omar Barghouti, co-founder of BDS Movement, felt compelled to respond to my piece calling me out in a letter published in, in the Crimson on Thursday for, quote, whitewashing Israel's apartheid regime, end quote. Harvard students are generally given a lot of attention. They love the spotlight, you know. <laughs> and they love when people view them as arbiters of right and wrong. The talking point often goes, if he said it and he went to Harvard, it must be so. So if the Crimson endorses BDS, they must have the immoral authority to do so, right? Exactly wrong. Rather, the rippling public outcry as a result of the Crimson's editorial is indicative of our exact challenge in fighting the battle against anti-Israel forces on campus today. We let a small group of very loud students control the narrative when it comes to discourse about Israel. By being loud and bold, they monopolize the spotlight. 
other BDS supporting anti-Israel groups on campus are just as scrappy, willing to play dirty. The wall built by anti-Israel groups at Harvard for the annual Israel Apartheid Week, which in true courtesy took place during Passover this year, is the definition of screaming in the spotlight. Placed in Harvard Yard, always overrun with tourists, the wall was covered with false and vitriolic statements such as Zionism is racism, settler colonialism, white supremacy, apartheid, painted in bright red so as to resemble blood. I'll admit, my editorial was a bit in your face. I meant for it to come off as dramatic, like a good Harvard student. I didn't want it to be a quiet conciliatory piece. I wanted to return their audacity with my own. But this is because Israel advocates are always so focused on playing nice, on fighting fire with water and not fire. We're always apologizing. Some on our side will so, go so far as to say things like, Israel's in the wrong, I know, or it's a very bad situation. It just, please don't use the word apartheid. This has to stop. We would never deign to slander Israel's detractors with the equivalent of some of the horrible things they say about us. Most in the pro-Israel community would never paint the words, all Palestinians are terrorists, in bright red across Harvard Yard, because we know it's not true. But our hesitation to delve into some of the sinister intentions of anti-Israel extremists and the willingness of some to report, resort to apologetics means we're just putting every anti-Israel fire out for a moment, only to face another bigger one for which we are grossly unprepared. It's high time we start operating on the offensive rather than the defensive. The Harvard administration is not going to save us. Although Harvard's president Bacow condemns academic boycotts, he won't explicitly condemn BDS by name. And there is radio silence among the school's other administrators. In a recent survey conducted by the Harvard Crimson, 34% of graduating Harvard students said they support BDS. These results are not because one third of the students polled are deeply anti-Zionists. It's because we are losing the marketing game and we are letting the loudest voices win while we attempt to play nice and let them walk all over us. We need a new strategy, one that will forge a generation of pro-Israel students that is not reactive, but proactive. We have to be just as motivated by activism and passion as our opponents. We let the cancel culture mob ally itself with BDS supporters, and now activists have channeled their fervor to the wrong side. The best pro-Israel students on campus can ask for right now is a speaker or an event that stirs the pot, albeit with better substance than the events of the other side. But the hurdles always seem to be so great, people are afraid to go big, go loud, and create controversy. The saying goes, go big or go home. But in our case, we have to go big, or else, to put it bluntly, we will have no home to go to. This work is complex and exhausting. There are countless student leaders across the US and around the world who are ready and anxious to step up. But we need your support. We count on the continued vital support of AJC, the thousand plus here of you in this room today and watching from home, other like-minded organizations, and the millions of pro-Israel supporters around the globe. We can reclaim the narrative, but it won't be achieved by op-eds in student newspapers alone. We need the support of public pro-Israel voices like yours, who can make their voices heard on campus and take back the spotlight from groups like the Crimson's editorial board. If we can all unite in this more proactive approach, we can begin to turn the tide on campuses near and far. Now is the time to be bold, decisive, and unrelenting. This is imperative if we want to help the next generation better understand Israel and internalize the central place of Israel in the heart of the Jewish people. Thank you, AJC, for giving me this platform and to all of you for the work you do day in and day out on behalf of the Jewish people and the state of Israel. I look forward to working alongside you as we work, back, work to take back the narrative on our beloved Israel. Thank you. One in four American Jews, 24%, report that they have been the target of anti-Semitism over the past 12 months. I showed up at my synagogue and there was a guy with like swastikas and KKK and SS on his jacket. I was walking into Mr. Broadway and then someone bumped into me and said like effing Jew. I'm called the fucking Jew. Fucking Jew doesn't have a place here. A Snapchat video showed a girl who was walking down the hallway and the person behind the camera asked her, what are we gonna do to Israel? And she said, we're gonna bomb Israel, you Jewish pieces of shit. 
especially in the LGBT community, there's so many people who want to demonize my existence for being a Jew, for being in support of Israel, and it wears on you because this is the antithesis of what it means to be progressive. On the one hand, it makes me angry and scared. And on the other hand, it makes me just want to get out there and be a loud, proud Jew. Please welcome our panelists, Jacob Kornblue, April Powers, and Andrew Rayfeld, along with our moderator, AJC U.S. Director for Combating Antisemitism, Holly Huffnagel. Here, I'll take her. We don't have much time, so I'll just, I'll just dive right in. We're gathered today seeing a current rise in anti-Semitism, and it's really one that began several years ago. It's become more violent and more open, and there are several reasons for the current rise. But one reason is that anti-Semitism in America today comes from many different sources, and it's really this complexity coming from so many different sides that creates the biggest challenge to combating it. You are all here today because you have very different experiences with anti-Semitism. And I want to begin by really unpacking what you're seeing. Andrew, I'd like to start with you. Today you are the head of the largest religiously liberal Jewish seminary in the nation and the first non-rabbi to head this prestigious institution, and you're here in New York. But I want to tap into what you saw before you came to Hebrew Union College. You spent 27 years in the Midwest. What was your experience like with anti-Semitism there in, in middle America, and what is changing? Holly, thank you so much, and congratulations to David Harris and the AJC for holding this important event. I think that there are differences in anti-Semitism in the way that hate is expressed, depending in large part by the degree to which haters anonymize or feel connected to the people that they're hating. In the Midwest, uh, more often than not, uh, haters, whether white supremacists or others, don't have personal relationships with Jews. And so you see the targets of their attack much more systematically being institutions that happen to be places where Jews are located rather than specifics. Think about the names of the cities that track a map of the most horrific anti-Semitic incidents in recent history, whether Colleysville, Texas, whether Pittsburgh, or Overland Park, Kansas. In each of those cases, it was an institution that was targeted for destruction for the people to, to be destroyed, not based on how people looked, but based on the institutions that they could define. And so I think that what we're seeing is the, uh, the need to create those personal relationships, which I know we'll talk about uh, a, a, a little later. Uh, but I think that the key here is that um, the an, an, an anonymity of the victim is critical, and it allows the kind of hate tropes and the tropes of anti-Semitism to percolate and to continue to spread because you keep this distance between the perpetrator and the victim uh, so far and so distant. Did you encounter, I'll just stick with you, um, Andrew, in the, in the Midwest, you know, where would you say the main sources are of anti-Semitism? Is it you know, the, the, the far right, Did people not know Jews? What was your experience? I think generally, if you look at the data, it is coming from the far right. Uh, in, in the Midwest, in the middle of the country. And again, this is because that is tending to be where Jews live. They tend to live in communities that are more politically liberal. And so people can develop relationships uh, with people that are, that are not as alienated or as uh, isolated on the right for that reason. And in St. Louis, did you, did you meet people that didn't know, didn't know Jews at all? You know, it was ironic. I was, uh, I was the CEO of the Jewish Federation for seven years. One of your national governors, Bob Newmark, I just want to shout out, is now the chairman of the uh, Jewish Federation of St. Louis. Um, but we were there when the first Jewish governor was elected. So there's this irony uh, that the state could elect someone who is Jewish, but nevertheless, people didn't know 
Jews. They didn't know institu uh, individuals. So I would have the kind of anti-Semitism that I would call casual anti-Semitism at the personal level. People just didn't know, oh, you're Jewish, how interesting. Well, what's that about? They just don't know. So there's a, there's a gap, a significant gap of knowledge. Thank you, Andrew. April, I'm gonna turn to you now. You actively work in progressive spaces, and I think the anti-Semitism that Andrew has experienced, whether it be from the far right, ignorance, maybe some elements of Christian anti-Judaism, that's not at all what you have experienced from, with your work. And if you could speak to us, you know, what happened to you last June and July uh, following the Hamas-triggered conflict with Israel in May, uh, what happened and where do you see anti-Semitism in, in, in progressive spaces? Thank you, Holly, and thank you to everyone here at the AJC for all the work that you do. It is so important um, for the world, really. And I say that um, as a chief equity and inclusion officer and somebody who works in this space for large um, companies. I was the head of, of equity and inclusion globally for a large nonprofit. And when we posted a statement against anti-Asian hate, I didn't have to go to the board. When I wanted to post a statement against anti-Semitism, I had to go to the board, and one of the board members said, oh, but we have to uh, mention Israel. I said, no, we do not. Jew hate predates Israel. So um, if it's a problem, I will post. I will make all the statements, and I can walk away if there's a problem, which ended up happening. But when I made the statement, uh, which did not mention Israel, someone attacked the statement in a mono monomaniacal tirade, uh, starting with, you know, yes, yay for making a statement against white supremacists and Christians. And I said, hate is not just from white supremacists and Christians. And then she said, well, where's the statement for uh, Palestinians and Muslims? And I said, when we see a surge, we'll post something. And that was it. And um, so she started talking about slaughtering children on a children's book website. So I deleted her, it kept going. I blocked her, I deleted Jews who said similar things. And then I was called a white supremacist Talmudic Jew see you next Tuesday expletive, and um, was told, uh, not by that person, but by somebody else, and the death threats came, the FBI got involved. Um, she posted hashtag free Palestine, and then it was on, right? Everybody came for me. We need a bat signal, so somebody needs to invent that one. Um, and so for me, uh, I was told because she went through all my social media posts and found me speaking to an Israeli group saying I was pro-Israel and that I loved India as well, coincidentally, and that I should not be doing the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it struck me, I'm like, maybe I shouldn't be here, right? I gained 20 pounds, I checked out, I stopped doing the work that I do. And then um, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back, because we have to, <laughs> yeah. I still have 15 to go, but, <laughs> but um, I have clothes to fit into, guys. So, so it's important um, for you to know that in progressive spaces, we're being asked to leave, mm -hmm. and we are leaving in record numbers mm -hmm. because, and we'll talk about that later, but we can't leave. We cannot. Yeah. Oh, I'm April, if you don't mind, if you just spend 30 more seconds, can you just tell us a little bit about your own identity, your own background, and what oh, that means for this sorry. space? Being called a white supremacist Jew, Talmudic Jew, see, um, as a black Jew um, who speaks fluent Spanish, who's lived in South America and Israel, m most of my family is, you know, either Latinx. My grandparents don't have a single white great grandchild, mm -hmm. um, and we have LGBTQ plus disabled neuroatypicality in my family, which is why I do the work that I do. Um, I am. 100% black, I'm 100% Jewish, and um, my mom is in the audience, fifth row center. <laughs> and so, I made Newsweek three times, I was asked to be on The View, this was a big news cycle, it made international news, and I did receive a lot of wonderful support from my Jewish community, so I wanna thank you for that. But yeah, being called a white supremacist yeah. for that reason was surprising, sorry. <laughs> thank, you, thank, thank you, thank you, April. Um, Jacob. You're a reporter. You, you actively cover issues of anti-Semitism. You're also visibly Jewish. And we know there's a huge uptick right now of anti-Semitic attacks uh, against visible Jews, against the Haredi community in New York. I wanna ask you, what are you seeing? What is the source or the sources of anti-Semitism here 
in, in New York City. It's not as simple as calling it far right or, or far left. That's my first question. And my second question is, how is the Haredi community feeling? How is this impacting this community, these attacks? Well, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to participate in such a, a great panel of experts on such an important conversation. Uh, I think there's a linkage, but also very different. Uh, the attacks that happen uh, mostly in New York City, but also not to exclude New Jersey and other states, is uh, there are coordinated attacks where you know, a uh, person uh, issues a manifesto, uh, buys uh, illegally a rifle and goes into a synagogue uh, to kill Jews or coordinates it with a different group uh, with an attempt to terrorize uh, an entire country. But there's also sort of, it's linked but not uh, as much, uh, is the unprovoked attacks. Those attacks where a person who is identifiably Jewish walking on the street uh, Friday night going to synagogue and getting attacked and that person is defenseless. He doesn't carry a gun. He doesn't even have whom to call because it's a Friday night, it's Saturday for him. So they are very uh, different, but it's matched up to an alarming uh, number of such incidents in recent years that you cannot just carry a simple slogan of saying, we need to combat anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism as a whole is targeted towards one group of Jews or to one specific ethnic group. They're very targeted attacks that a person who hates Jews specifically, but also who sees an opportunity walking on the street, uh, being able to commit a crime just because it's very simple to just pick up your fist and punch the person and see him mm -hmm. helpless or her helpless uh, on, on, on the street. So that is something that I see in, 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 in the various communities, but especially in the Haredi communities in Brooklyn, where they feel sort of that, you know, they are not part of the larger conversation of combating anti-Semitism, if it's anti-Semitism on college campuses, if it's anti-Semitism um, as in terrorism, as in domestic terrorism, but just individual attacks where they can't help themselves but to sort of protect themselves by different measures that we can talk about. Absolutely, and I think when we talk about the attacks in Muncie or in Jersey City or the attacks in Brooklyn, you know, these aren't white supremacist attacks and we have to look at where are they coming from? Why are they happening? And I, I want to transition here because I think it's so much easier to talk about the problem, the challenge. And all of your different stories reveal different sources of anti-Semitism. It's actually much more difficult to talk about what's actually working. Where do we need to go? Uh, what prescriptions do we have that are going to actually move the needle um, to combat each of these sources distinctively? And so, April, I want to turn back to you because I think Fighting anti-Semitism in progressive spaces is really where we're going to be in the next five, ten years. And your personal experience really does reflect a larger and, and growing problem. Um, there's a lack of understanding about who Jews are, about anti-Semitism as it can relate to Israel. So what do you recommend for us? Where do we need to, to what do we, where do we need to go? What do we need to do in progressive spaces? I think for anyone who d defines themselves as a progressive, I'm going to quote my business partner with Jubian Princess, Kiyomi Kowalski, to say, and hide Kiyomi, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. The second we leave, it's over. So get back in there. It, I know it's tough. It was, I was, you know, I was a mess for months. But you've got to get back in there. You've got to encourage your kids to, you know, what would happen if we all put our kippot back on and wore our Stars of David? I rock mine. I have a big high from my mother-in-law, and it's everywhere. So what if? What if they had to confront the fact that the person that they loved was a Jew? So we've got to get back in there, get people to know us. Two, I hate to break this to you. Think 1922 Germany. It's 2022. We're not white. They're never going to think of us as white. So y you've got to consider if, you know, white supremacy doesn't think of us as white. We have to be, we're maybe white adjacent if you're Ashkenazi, 
but we also have to put Jews of color and marginalized Jews front and center in a lot of the work that you do because they need to know that we are out here and that we are suffering along with the Jewish people. And I'm already marginalized. I'm ar I've already been, you know, I've already gone through whatever it is as a brown woman. So you have something for me on Judaism? Bring it, right? Like, like we've got you. But you also have to embrace the Jews of color, the marginalized Jews, and, and, and help us out and make us feel welcome and a part of the solution. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Jacob, I want to turn to you for, for solutions um, from, from your vantage point. To date, we haven't seen violence, uh, consistent violence coming at all from the progressive uh, community, but the Hasidic community is facing that consistent violence. And it's coupled with a challenge that we have right now in America. With, we do studies. Americans don't really know who Jews are. And they also distinguish between non-visible Jews and visible Jews, the Hasidic community, as different entities. So my question for you is, what can be done specifically to counter the anti-Semitism that's being directed toward the visibly Jewish community? And then second, how can we work better together within the Jewish community to fight anti-Semitism? Well, the, the second question is part of the answer. I would say it's a combination of four. Uh, the first, the mayor and the governor spoke about it, it's uh, enforcement. If it's um, adding additional policing, security measures outside institutions, uh, monitoring social media, that's all part of the enforcement. The second is prosecution. If you arrest uh, an individual who's committed a crime, charge them with a hate crime and make sure that they're not let out um, on bail or that they actually get, I mean, the statistics shows, according to the NYPD, that a large percent of those who are arrested never got charged with a hate crime. Uh, the third is education. We need to educate ourselves, obviously uh, the various communities, but also the, the, the American uh, uh, public, uh, if it's various uh, faith and ethnic communities, about each other's traditions, about each other's uh, uh, practices, so we know there could be uh, a Jew just wearing a yarmulke and still be considered an observant Jew. You don't need to, to wear a garb or a Magandavit to be considered a Jew. But I think the, the, the second question, which is the fourth part, is bridge building. I mean, AJC has been doing great work uh, within, uh, between uh, black and, and Jewish communities, but it's also within the Jewish communities. Uh, I speak regularly to reform conservative and orthodox leaders. And I ask them, why don't we see orthodox leaders visit reform synagogues and temples and reform leaders visit orthodox shuls and yeshivas? Let's have a conversation together about this, how we address this issue, but also we can agree on so much of this, these four things that I spoke about, we can agree that you can be progressive but still want security measures for, for Jewish institutions. You can be progressive, but still want a person of hate to be ch charged with crime. You can be on the far right or a uh, Republican, but still want to learn about another community, about others. And I think together, if we know that we are all in this together, we are all facing uh, from different points, but we're all facing the same level of hate from these groups, then we can work together. We can really build that bridge that we can sort of combat that and actually see a brighter future for all of us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Now, Andrew, in the, the closing minutes, I want to turn back to you. What should we do in spaces where there aren't many Jews to tackle these challenges? We know from our studies that people who know Jews they're more likely to know what anti-Semitism anti is, know that it's rising, know that, uh, that we need to combat it. So what do we do in spaces where people don't know Jews, where there might be attitudinal or conspiratorial anti-Semitism? And then if you could take what you learned in the Midwest and what you're learning now in New York, are there shared recommendations from these two distinct types of anti-Semitism that you can offer us? 
Thank you, Holly. And I, since he invoked the reform movement, I just have to say absolutely to Jacob that we need to build those bridges. And uh, I so appreciate your leadership on that and saying that I'm committed to doing it and just uh, that's, that's our future. Uh, so the, the, the lessons from the Midwest, I think, are not a whole lot different than for the, the East. But what we learned in St. Louis and what we do in the Midwest is do the work that AJC has been doing all along. And that is number one, creating connections between Jewish leadership and civic leadership. Trips to Israel, trips to Washington, trips to our federations and our communities. These build personal relationships with those in the halls of power, in legislatures, in the governor's office, Republican, Democrat, independent, it doesn't matter. Number two, building interfaith relationships so that religious Christians and Muslims can understand what it means to be Jewish, what it means to be a minority, understand that Jews are not different than them. We are all in the image of God. And number three, let us remember that as a Jewish community in North America and globally in the state of Israel, we are a strong people, a people with great strength that comes from our tradition, our courage, and our resources that we have. And let us lead from strength. And what that means for us at Hebrew Union College, and I think for all of us, and what a powerful speech that Natalie from Harvard just gave a minute ago. We need to lead knowing our values, knowing the strength, and having the courage to allow diverse opinions within our communities flourishing about the very things that we are challenged by, perhaps ourselves. When I began at the Federation 10 years ago, I remember the first arguments I had heard outside of the academy as a professor at Washington University in St. Louis. The first arguments I heard in the, outside of the academy were why boycotts against Israel should be banned. Why? Because boycotts, they were told me, were anathema to democracy. Well, that's a bad argument, and we should know better and we should know better because boycotts, whether in Montgomery, Alabama, are key to democratic action. So we need to ask the more sophisticated argument, why is BDS anti-Semitic? And I believe it is, and we fought against it. And the work, again, I want to just praise David Harris and the AJC in leading this. We need to have broader shoulders, wider hallways for conversations, and not alienate our very people, our young people, that want those conversations. Again, I believe we can do it by leading from strength. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, April, and thank you, Jacob. Anti-Semitism is not going to completely go away, but we can push it to the fringes of the society where it belongs, where it's socially unacceptable. And I want to thank you for your honesty, your, your vulnerability even, your poignant reflections, and your, your powerful prescriptions of how we can go forward. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.